All right, guys, today I got Michael Tonsmeyer with me from Sapwood Cellars. One, two, one, two, three, go! Hey, 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 fill it up, fill it up, hey, 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 fill it up, fill it up, hey, 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 fill it up, fill it up, hey, hey, hey. Michael, how you doing, man? I'm doing well. Thanks for inviting me on the show. Hey, thank you very much for coming on the show. I, I appreciate it greatly. I got to imagine uh, the day-to-day is pretty busy for you guys. You had mentioned it's a, it's a big canning day at the brewery, so uh, a good chance to to escape that and, and hit up a little podcast action and, and tell your story. And I'm a big fan of, of what you guys are doing at Sapwood. I think that the techniques you guys use are awesome, and I try to uh, keep peeking at your portfolio to to try to mirror some of the stuff I'm doing on the homebrew side. You know, before I get too far into, into you know, you guys starting up Sapwood, what was kind of the or, original idea that you and Scott had when this, this the whole genesis of, of Sapwood was coming about? Sure. Uh, the, the genesis is that Scott was uh, looking to start a brewery on his own. He had written up a business plan. He had taken uh, a couple of tours of some little places and uh, just really said, this is too big a, an apple for one person to bite. Um, particularly if you're looking to be a brewery with a tasting room and do some distribution, it's just, you know, you've got to come up with branding, you've got to come up with, you know, employees and uh, there's you know mechanical stuff and there's recipes and all those things. Uh, and he just went, you know, I'm, I'm going to sit on it for a while. And, you know, if something changes, maybe I'll come back to it. Uh, and we were at a friend's house and I was drinking some of his hazy IPA and probably had one too many and said, Hey, uh, you know, if, if you ever thought about opening a brewery, like you're a pretty fantastic brewer and you're, a, you're a good guy. And, uh, you know, maybe, you know, maybe that'd be a fun idea. And he said, you know, it's funny. I've actually got a business plan ready to go. If you, if you're really interested, like we can make this happen real quick. Boom. Uh, and I think it was probably just maybe about a year from then we were actually opening up. Um, so it was, you know, he had really ra- uh, laid the groundwork for it. Um, and what were you doing? Originally, before- our business plan was we were going to go sort of that model that uh, Rare Barrel and the Referend and sort of this blendery model where they purchase work from a, a brewery with a brew house and they put it in barrels and age it and just sort of maybe do, um, you know, some bottle releases or some limited draft. Uh, and we really stumbled into this uh, great property that had already been built out to be a brewery by a uh, company that didn't make it, that didn't, you know, for whatever reason, uh, weren't able to open their doors. Uh, so we walked into it and the tasting room was already built out. We had, um, you know, a, a cold box. We had a bar. There was oh, a pad for sweet. all of our equipment. Yeah, that's um, awesome. And we went, oh, okay, so, you know, maybe now for that money we'd saved up for the tasting room that can now be a, a bigger system or a system and, and some bigger tanks. Um, so we really um, I lucked into, but, but it's also, um, we weren't in a big hurry because we both had full-time jobs. Um, yeah, what, were you, what were you doing say, before oh, I'm, you I'm, uh, started at Sapwood? What were you doing? Uh, I was an economist for the Bureau of Labor Statistics uh, oh, here okay. in DC. So a little bit of a change there from going out. Yeah, and, and, and Scott was a, um, he worked for a, a lobbying company or a lobbyist that uh, lobbied in favor of financial regulation. So very much a different uh, sort of work than we both did before. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, you know, we were sort of lucky to, to get things running on our own. And we've been lucky to be able to hire, um, you know, a, a home brewer who is also a bar manager who has really, you know, kept that whole side of the operation running. And now we have a, a fantastic uh, full-time brewer for the last uh, almost uh, almost two years now, uh, Ken, who was uh, uh, been a professional brewer for seven or eight years before he joined us. So he really uh, had worked at some bigger places and really knew um, professional brewing process where we were sort of home brewers, um, still kind of uh, figuring out how to do things in an efficient way. Yeah. What was the biggest, you know, or a couple of the biggest, you know, changes when you're going from the homebrew scale to the the professional scale you know you got this new system this this massive space you know going from you know i don't know where you guys were brewing before but i brew in my basement i can only imagine you know going into yep, a multi- backyard yeah you know going to a big you know several thousand square foot warehouse or location and you know turning the key on a big system had to be a, a, a pretty big uh, step for you guys really 
Yeah, we uh, we asked a lot of friends. Both of us had done some consulting and interviews, and where so we we had contacts in the industry. And usually we'd just reach out to somebody and say, hey, and we're really, we're trying to figure out cleaning was honestly the biggest thing. Because cleaning um, on a homebrew scale is just you, you know, take your carboy or your bucket or your fermenter and you fill it with hot water and some PBW and yeah. soak it. And it's, Boom, and it's you know, yeah. yeah. And on a commercial scale, uh, we do CIP clean in place. So that is um, a relatively small amount of chemical, you know, 10 gallons, 15 gallons. And then you are, we're circulating it through the different pieces through a spray ball to get the inside clean. But then there's all these fittings and, and some brewers will say, oh, you know, you take, take all the fittings apart um, every time you disassemble your whole tank. And some will say, oh, you can do that once every six months or once a year. Um, and so for us, there was a lot of that early on of figuring out sort of what made the most sense uh, from a practicality standpoint, but also just from a, you know, cleaning a tank can, can take a long time. And so, um, you know, it, we, we have a limited amount of time and time you're cleaning the tank is time that you're not, you know, uh, out there in the tasting room talking to customers or you're not, you know, doing a test batch or you're not doing something that's more um, maybe valuable to the, the company. And partly that's why we then eventually hired a, a part-time sellerman and now a full-time brewer slash uh, sellerman. So he can, you know, really do that kind of stuff and we can focus on the more um, uh, unique pieces of running a brewery. Yeah. So you say, you know, spending time in, in the, in the tasting room with, uh, you know, people going in to try your beer, uh, you know, how does that interaction go? What are you guys looking for? Uh, you know, when you walk into the tasting room, is it feedback? Is it just to share the experience? Uh, what do you look for? Yeah. So a big piece of it is just the fact that Scott and I are relatively well known in, in home brewing circles that will get people who will stop by the tasting room. Um, so we're not too far off of 95. So we'll get a lot of people in a, you know, sort of pre COVID days more, um, hey, I'm driving down from Maine to Florida, and I saw you guys were, you know, a 20 minute detour. Hey, is Mike or Scott there? I'd, I'd really like to have them sign my book or say hi to them, or could I get a quick tour? Um, and that is a relatively small part of our business financially. I mean, obviously, like the regulars that are in the tasting room, those sorts of people who are in there on a regular basis, either drinking or, or getting a case to go. Um, but I always feel like those people are your biggest advocates. And we, we get people who come in and say, oh, my, my husband read Scott's book. Um, and since I was in town for a, a knitting convention, this is an actual story. Uh, you know, he said that I had to come here and get, you know, one of whatever you had to go and, you know, to take home. Or, oh, my, my son-in-law loves this place. He, you know, um, said that, you know, if I was ever in the area, I had to stop by, those sorts of things. I mean, those are the people who are going to, you know, talk you up online. They're the people who are going to, you know, suggest their friends go there. They're going to all those things that are um, helping to, you know, build the brand through word of mouth and things like that. And so being extra nice to those people, but also those people usually are the ones who are a lot more fun to talk to because oh, yeah. they're not just, you know, someone who's here because they saw we have some new stout that's a 4.5 on untapped. They're here because they brewed my dark saison recipe from American sour beers and want to, you know, drop off a bottle for me. And, uh, Hey, if they could look at the barrel room, that would be really fun too. That's awesome. So yes, yeah, so you're, you know, just building up a sense of community in that tap room. And would you say that you guys get, uh, you know, compared to, you know, other craft breweries, do you get a lot of that homebrew crowd, you know, making their way to, to your spot? I think certainly for the size we are, um, obviously, once you get to some certain scale of, you know, Russian River or, you know, Trillium or other half or whoever that just have, you know, big, bigger reach, bigger name, you know, that people are sort of more, but we, we get a lot of that more sort of targeted, nerdy. Um, I listened to that podcast with you on whatever, and it really inspired me to change this or that, or um, we, we get that a lot from uh, professional brewers too. I just went to a new brewery that opened in the area and uh, the guy was telling me, oh, yeah, like Scott's new post on survivabilities and, you know, hop, hop products. Uh, really, you know, we use that a lot on our first New England IPA that we uh, just released. Um, you know, it was really helpful. We thought it turned out great. So it's um, fun seeing it from sort of both sides, the home brewers and the uh, professional. Yeah, I got to imagine that's pretty fulfilling. You know, when you're able to remain close to your roots the whole time, you know, there's still that like home brewing community and element that's, you know, a part of what you guys are doing at a professional scale. 
And, uh, and that's awesome. I think that's important. If I were in your position, I know I would really like that a lot. You know, you get to talk shop. It's always fun when you're, when you're in that, uh, shop talk process and, you know, going over, you know, the latest and greatest, you know, all that good stuff. Uh, and speaking of what are you guys doing right now? Uh, you know, the last few months that you've kind of stumbled upon, you know, brewing technique wise that you really feel like is, is making the beer better. Last last few months, so um, I'd say the the sort of newest thing that we've really sort of added to our repertoire is um, looking into sort of distilled hop oils, um, and that's sort of an area that um, all of a sudden seems to have exploded. For a long time, there were um, a couple products available, and we'd we'd tried a few of them and sort of been pretty underwhelmed. Um, we did a collaboration with uh, New Zealand Hops, which is sort of the co-op that owns and grows and processes most of the hops in New Zealand. And they partnered with a company called Total Natural Solutions, which is in England. Um, and they have one of the few systems uh, in the world. I think, I think Yakima might, might be adding one, but essentially they can um, fractionalize the hops so they can distill off and then they can even control like, hey, do we want more of the uh, green aromatics? Do we want more of the fruity compounds? And so, you know, you can get citra extract that, uh, you know, expresses more of that uh, myrosine, which is like the really green, grassy, piney thing, or they can play that down and just really push the citrus and the melon and the tropical. Um, and for us, it's definitely not a replacement for dry hopping. It's a keep our dry hopping levels the same and then add like an extra boost of aromatic uh, oomph. Um, like any sort of product there, they, oh, you know, you could, you know, not dry hop at all and you'd, you know, get better yields or that the, the shelf life of your beer would be better. Um, and we're always just much more interested in, will it make better beer? Does it make a beer that, yes. you know, I couldn't otherwise, or that, you know, wouldn't be as good. Yeah. Hop oils are a cool thing. I've, you know, I've played around a little bit with, uh, some of the stuff from Yakima Valley hops, they have little hop shots and, you know, my experience with, with hop oils has just been on the bittering side. I've never been able to play around, you know, on that side where, you know, getting those aromatics and the late, late hop additions or even dry hopping. I didn't even know that was something that you could do is use, you know, hop oil extract for, for a, a dry hopping uh, part of, of the uh, process. So that, that's pretty neat. Um, yeah. And this uh, uh, total natural TNS uh, is fun too. They actually sell relatively small ones that are uh, intended for, I think it's like 15 gallons or something. Um, they've been a little hit or miss for us. Some of the, um, single hop ones have been great. We really like the Citra and the Mosaic and the Simcoe, uh, and the Galaxy and the Nelson. Um, but they do a bunch of sort of blended, like an IPA one that we tried that we just sort of didn't seem to add much. And, um, they also do some sort of fruit ones too, that are also kind of come off a little bit artificial, but, um, the, the hop ones are nice and just sort of as that top note, that little extra oomph, um, people really, beer drinkers want to be wowed. Uh, and that's sort of one way we found that, you know, sort of can give us a little bit more character, something that is going to um, really leap out of the glass, which is what we're looking for. And where do you guys use them predominantly or do you spread it out? No, so we will use that at the very end. So after the dry hops are done, after we've uh, dropped as much of the hop material in the yeast out as we can, uh, and then we'll just do it to taste. And it, it's very little, it's, you know, something like, um, I can't remember what, what it's, so it's like 10 mils to 20 mils per barrel. So, I mean, less than a milliliter per gallon. Um, and so it's just a very tiny amount um, and to taste. Um, with anything like that, anytime you're talking about extracts, at a certain level, you add too much, it, it takes on sort of a, a fake flavor. There's something that's just like a little bit wrong about it that just doesn't... Um, you know, it's, I think it's just like if you add, you know, vanilla extract to something, if you add so much that all of a sudden it just sort of has that extracty flavor, for lack of yeah. a better phrasing. No, it becomes um, almost like overwhelming and like, hey, this doesn't really fit in anymore. I, I know what you're talking about. Yeah, and, exactly. And, and and so sort of doing it to take, I mean, like, like, and then eventually you learn, you know, approximately for this oil, we like a little more, a little less, but, you know, we've sort of been dialing that in. Have you ever tasted those oils directly? Uh, I have not. They most of them really do not smell great on their own. It's so concentrated. Um, it's the equivalent again, you know, like one milli or one, you know, a couple of drops is you know the hop aroma you'd have in, um, you know, a, a gallon of beer. Um, I would say the these for the most part are they don't have any of the bittering compounds. So I think it would just be 
you know, like, again, like drinking vanilla extract or something like it would just be intense and probably stick around in your mouth for a while. Yeah. Are the, are the alpha acids pretty high on these as well? The, even the ones that you're using for, uh, you know, the dry hop and anyone who's listening, alpha acid, uh, the, the alpha acid content is, is what lends that bitterness to the beer, especially if you use it on the hot side and you're, you're boiling with it, it's going to make the beer really bitter. And even on the cold side, it'll bitter to some extent. Uh, so are these, uh, these oils that you guys are using in the dry hop stage, you know, super late, are they still high alpha acid? No. So these, these in particular are zero alpha. They have removed that part entirely. Um, there are a couple that we've been playing around with. We just added a new product from Barth Haas. Uh, so Barth Haas makes a product called Incognito, which is like those hop shots you get from uh, Northern Brewer or More Beer or whoever. They are just, um, they take uh, super critical CO2 and they sort of extract everything from the hop. Alpha acids, beta acids, aromas, all of that. Um, and so uh, Incognito is sort of like, it has alpha, it's really intended, yeah, for a Whirlpool edition or something like that. But they have a new product called Spectrum, which is, it sort of sounds like it's incognito, maybe with a bunch of the alpha acids removed. It still has some, but just not nearly as much. Um, so we just add that sort of late fermentation on a, a hazy IPA. Um, we, so and this is sort of the, one of those homebrew to commercial beer differences. Um, as homebrewers, we would do a lot of those uh, late fermentation sort of additions. Beer still fermenting add a charge of hops. Um, it's a nice time as a home brewer because uh, the yeast is still active. They'll scavenge any oxygen. Um, it sort of maybe blows off some of those green flavors, the grassy flavors that sort of get in the way of the juiciness. But for whatever reason on a commercial scale, whenever we've tried it, either um, the beer uh, gets a little like, like astringency or like some hop burn, that sort of bitterness that catches in your throat, or uh, even if that doesn't happen, it just like won't get that much hop aroma. And so we're playing around with some of these uh, less processed extracts as earlier additions because they're not gonna have all the polyphenols. They're not gonna have uh, a lot of the other stuff that hop pellets would. They're not gonna get into the yeast and make the yeast difficult to harvest. Um, and so we've been sort of experimenting with that and, and sort of haven't found anything that really has wowed us yet, but we're still kind of you know at the, the early stages of that. Yeah, it's a it's a fun new toy, and you know, in 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 a, in a way. So, what do you guys shoot for typically as far as uh, IBUs go in your beer? How how bitter are are you trying to come in at relatively? Say with you know, like a you know six percent hazy. Sure. So uh, I actually have absolutely no idea how many IBUs are in our beers. We we use Beersmith, and we we you know got it set up, and we sort of know. Um, according to Beersmith, how many IBUs we have. Uh, we don't publicize it particularly. And I, I mean, I'm happy to say like for a pale ale, Beersmith thinks we have, I think it's like 80 IBUs. An IPA is probably like 90 and a double IPA is like 100 or 110. Uh, but it's basically almost all uh, Whirlpool editions. And okay. I'm pretty sure that it is overestimating how much bitterness we have because most of our beers have very little perceived bitterness. Um, they always have a little bit, we tend to finish our beers a little bit sweeter than some places. So we finish in the um, 1020 to 1025 sort of range for most of our hoppy stuff. Uh, and that sweetness helps to sort of balance out that what bitterness there is. Um, I, I don't think Scott's ever sort of gotten a great explanation for it. We, um, we find that if we don't get enough bitterness, enough hop material in the kettle that we end up with a beer that has, it's a different sort of bitterness. And I don't know that it's, um, so when, when you have those like zero IBU beers where it's like hundred percent dry hop, there's just like a roughness to them. There's a, Scott claims he can smell it. I've, I've never fully understood what he's smelling, um, but there's definitely something that like is a little off about those beers. And so we tend to do, um, basically all of our beers are two pounds per barrel and my math is always bad in that. That is two pounds per barrel is the same as one ounce per gallon. I think that's how that math works because a barrel is 31 gallons and a pound is 16 ounces. And so it goes that direction, I think. So in some something like five ounces in a five gallon batch, which as a home brewer wasn't sort of a, a really big whirlpool addition. Um, but on a commercial scale, and that's going back to something we learned, um, 
At homebrew, even if you add some hops right at flame out, even if you don't chill the word immediately, if you do a hop stand or a wool pull addition, that word's just going to be cooling down because there just isn't a huge amount of mass. Um, on, a, on our system, we'll whirlpool for 20 minutes, then we'll let it settle for 20 minutes for all those tops to settle down at the bottom of the, the uh, boil kettle. And then we'll run it through our heat exchanger. And that whole thing can take um, at least an hour, usually closer to an hour and 15. And so those hops that we add at flame out are still sitting at maybe 206 or 207 degrees Fahrenheit, um, you know, an hour later and probably still getting some bitterness out of them. And so that's sort of where the sort of trickiness of, of uh, IBU calculation comes in at our scale. We probably should have some of our beers tested at some point just for you know, our own edification. Um, but I would say we tend to be a little sweeter and a little more bitter. Um, as a home brewer, I would always add a little bit of like a 15 or a 30 minute charge just to get that bitterness. Um, and that really isn't necessary. Um, with our system, we just have a limited amount of hops we can fit in there. Uh, and so that's, yeah, so, somewhere in that, I would honestly bet that like the finished beer, our pale ales are probably closer to 40, our IPAs are closer to 50, and maybe our doubles are 55 or 60. Something like that would be like my, my palate's opinion of the IBU number. Okay, that makes sense. And when you guys are whirlpooling, what, uh, what temperature do you find works best for extracting those, those good, you know, fruity characteristics, the, the citrus, just those notes that get away from the, you know, super piney bitterness of, of a lot of beer? Yeah, so for sort of, I'll say, uh, practicality purposes. So like we have a lot of, we have a 10 barrel system, so like 300 gallons, but we have a lot of 600 gallon tanks, uh, 20 barrels. Um, and so in one day we'll brew two batches of an IPA or two batches of a double IPA while one is boiling, we're mashing the second one. Um, and so for, again, for sort of practicality purposes, we don't pre-chill the first whirlpool, we'll do that at boil. And then we'll adjust the second one down to 160, 170, 180. Um, a lot of that target is based on uh, bitterness. So if we happen to be doing a pale ale, um, we will tend to, you know, particularly if we've got some higher alpha hops in the whirlpool, we will cool that whirlpool down further than we would for say a double IPA or particularly like we just did our, our first triple IPA and that one we did both whirlpools pretty close to um, a boil. Um, I find for the most part that uh, warmer temperatures tend to drive off more of the green woody sort of characters, but I think a lot of that gets driven off by fermentation too. So while the wort may taste relatively different, I find, depending on our uh, whirlpool temperature, by the end of fermentation, that's sort of where um, uh, things kind of even out a lot um, in, in my experience. And so I'm, I tend to be more playing around with what the IBU numbers are, what specifically, you know, what hops we're using, if we wanted to use a bunch of mosaic in a pale ale, I'll definitely go the lower end because it's a little bit higher alpha acid. If we're uh, doing a double IPA, you know, I'm, I'm probably whirlpooling uh, closer to, uh, you know, just sort of flame out. Um, we'll extend our whirlpools for the lower temp by a little bit. We'll give them a little bit more time just because it's a, uh, a, a lower temperature and, you know, heat helps to extraction, those sorts of things. Um, we've been surprised how different some hops come through on the whirlpool versus dry hopping. Um, as a home brewer, I was very much about just like, oh, if I'm making a citron mosaic IPA, I'll add citron mosaic in the whirlpool and I'll dry hop with citron mosaic. It was just sort of, you know, an easy, easy thing to do. Um, and we've been really impressed by, there are some varieties that like, I, you know, when I've used them for dry hopping, just haven't impressed. Um, Idaho 7 is like that, uh, Rawaka, uh, Enigma, um, I'm, Mosaic and Simcoe too are just really great in the kettle. Um, the beer post fermentation has a great sort of fruity, hoppy, saturated uh, aroma and flavor, and then the dry hops just sort of add to that. Um, and then there's some other varieties like Citra. Just for me, has never uh, wowed me in the whirlpool. Um, often after fermentation, it it just doesn't have that much of a hop aroma to it um, compared to some of those other ones and. Um, some of the older, more classic varieties can work really well too. Cascade and Columbus and, and Centennial and Chinook. Um, the only problem with them is they tend to be a lot more variable. Those hops have been around for so long and so much of what's being grown is a cutting of a cutting of a cutting. 
and um, you know, you'll see the alpha acids vary and the, you know, where they're grown varies. And sometimes we'll get some cascade that's just really fantastic. And sometimes we'll get some that's sort of uninspired for lack of a, a better phrase. So and kind so, of a, kind of a wild card when you're using the, uh, you know, the, the, the OGs on the block, so to speak. Yeah, exactly. I think so much of that. And, and some of them can be fantastic. Um, we're just sort of getting into like hop contracts and things like that. But um, even something like that, it's, it's not necessarily, it, it can be that, you know, when you open the bag and you smell it, that they'll be very different. But a lot of these hops, I haven't figured out a good way yet to determine how they'll be in the kettle, in the whirlpool without actually brewing with them. So I don't even know how you'd, you know, pick them out. Um, we're, we're big advocates of if you're dry hopping with a hop, smell it, open up the bag, smell it, take a couple pellets out, rub them between your hands. Um, because when you're dry hopping, most of the character that's in the hop, that aroma is going to be transferred to the beer. Um, it's not, you know, the fermentation's not changing it. It's just sort of being extracted. And so um, only using hops that really smell fantastic is a big part. And we're small enough and we don't have consistent enough hops to um, not smell it. And we'll, we'll change a beer. We, for a while, we couldn't find good Amarillo. And we had a couple of beers that were supposed to have Amarillo and we'd get a couple of bags in and we'd open them up and would smell them and they'd be oniony or they'd just, you know, smell sulfury or something like that. And sometimes those hops work perfectly well in the whirlpool. A lot of those off flavors just get blown off. Um, but for dry hopping, we'll just say, hey, I guess we're not doing Amarillo this time. What do we have in the, the walk-in? Hey, we've got some Nelson, we've got some Citra, we've got some Mosaic. Let's pick one of those that will work better on, on this batch. Yeah. And you know, it's funny, just the different, you know, different characteristics you pick up from the different zones. Uh, I know here in, in Michigan, there's a big hop farmer, um, hop head farms, uh, and the Michigan Chinook that's grown here has kind of a distinct pineapple aroma that's nice in the uh, dry hop. Uh, so that's a fun one to play around with, especially being able to showcase some some local hops in in my beer. Uh, but back to back to your hops. What what are what are your like top three favorite hops to use? So it, the our our joke for a long time has been cheater hops, and it started as just sort of like a joke between Scott and I that you know essentially. Uh, you know, someone would bring a, an IPA to the local homebrewing meeting. We were both in DC. We were both still in DC homebrewers. Uh, I, I uh, was just the being the other night. Um, and, you know, someone shows up with a beer that's uh, Citra Galaxy double IPA. That's cheating. Of course, it's a good <laughs> beer. They, you know, that doesn't take any skill from, you know, you, the, I mean, this is all, of course, not, not, not true in the least, but. Uh, you know, it doesn't take any skill to make a beer with Nelson. It doesn't take any skill to make a beer with Mosaic. Um, and certainly I still love all those. I, I, I can't remember, we, we do a beer called Cheater Hops. And so we, it's just sort of our rotating IPA. And so um, we've tried, you know, uh, uh, let's say Citra, Mosaic, Nelson, Galaxy, Simcoe. I bet we've done pretty much all of those combinations at least once. We've definitely, you know, we've done Citra Mosaic, we've done Citra Galaxy, we've done Citra, you know, Citra Simcoe. Um, all of those hops have a lot of punchy aromatics that come through. They have um, aromatics we, we really like. Um, Nelson can certainly be sort of um, divisive. There are definitely good friends whose palates I respect who just will not drink a beer with Nelson because of how it tastes or smells. Um, Honestly, Nelson may be my favorite hop. I, that that New Zealand white wine rhubarb funky sort of blend of aromatics it can bring when it's when it's good. I I I, I were having um, Alpine uh, Nelson back in the day from uh, Alpine Brewing. That was I, one of the the first IPAs I had that just was like, wow, what is this? This does not smell. Or, it's not citrusy. It's not. It doesn't smell or taste like any other beer I've had. It just had that that. I don't know, dank white wine, you know, again, cat pee or whatever, if, if you don't like it, but, um, so like Nelson is definitely up there. Um, galaxy has been breaking my heart recently. We've gotten a lot of galaxy that smells like peanut shells. Um, and galaxy is very expensive. We pay, you know, more than $20 a pound for it, even, even on, you know, wholesale bulk, whatever. And we've opened a lot that has been 
yeah, like pe peanut shell. Like it, you think you're making a beer that, you know, it's going to be like a PB and J double IPA, which I'm sure is a thing, but it's not, yeah, you know, not, not what not, we're trying not to what make. you guys are going for. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then it's so, and so like when, when galaxy is great, that like, uh, fr fruit stripe gum, uh, gummy bear, whatever sort of thing. Um, at speak, speaking of Michigan hops, we just uh, did a beer with Galaxy and a hop called Hydra from, um, oh, it, I think Great Lakes Farms grows it, and but we got from, I think they're called Hang 'em High. Um, and Hydra has a lot of the same sort of character of Galaxy. It has that sort of fruity gum kind of thing but um, it's a little bit, at least for us, had been more consistent and was just like, didn't have any sort of weird other flavors. Um, and then honestly, I'd say like Mosaic. Mosaic, I, I, pretty much every box of Mosaic we've ever gotten has been really good. Um, I really enjoy that Mosaic has some dankness, some fruitiness. It's a great single hop, but it also sort of plays well with, um, with other varieties, so. Yeah, no doubt. Those are, those are all tasty hops. Uh, I chuckle every time I, I hear, uh, cheater hops thrown out. I, th I think of, uh, think of you guys. So I think you guys have, uh, have the unofficial trademark on the, on the cheater hop tag. What, yeah, what I'd, I'd like to think so. I think, um, there's a brewery that has a beer called all the cheater hops and we were waiting for our cease and desist and it never came. So we're hoping they, they at least, you know, let us, you know, skirt by on that one. Yeah. Uh, what's like the, you know, if you, if, there, if there's an oddball hop that sticks out in your mind, you know, something that isn't, super well-known or used a lot in, in hoppy beers, you know, what comes to mind? Um, you know, uh, cashmere. I, I don't know how cool cashmere is right now, but um, I've really been enjoying, we've done a couple of beers with cashmere. We do a beer called Exaggerated Truth, which is all cashmere. And I think it's one of our higher rated uh, IPAs. Um, I think cashmere plays well with other flavors. So in that one, we blend in a tiny amount of Hefeweizen yeast. So we do English ale, sort of our, our house base yeast. It's a variant on 1318. Um, and then we blend in like three or 4% Hefeweizen yeast. And it gives it just a very, you don't get the clove, but you get that sort of banana-y sort of extra fruity thing. And then cashmere has this um, lemongrass, but also it has like a mango thing and just sort of like a tropical aroma thing. Um, and yeah, ca cashmere's worked really well. And I, I don't know why we haven't used it more because we probably should um, with other blends. Because I, I think it's almost always we've done, we had wheat beer with just cashmere. We did a collab with our friends at uh, Suspended Brewing that was uh, cashmere and motueka and uh, macadamia milk uh, since uh, Scott's vegan and, and their uh, owner, head brewer, uh, Josie is vegan as well. So we pushed that milkshake IPA concept as, as far as we could without uh, lactose. Yeah, that's awesome. How did that macadamia nut milk play out? I'm curious. Uh, it was okay. Uh, it was it was a weird beer. So uh, we used, and again, I, I, I don't know how familiar and comfortable sort of brewers are with genetically modified uh, yeast. Um, we have been using them. Uh, Omega Labs in Chicago does a couple of strains where they took um, existing strains in their portfolio and pulled out the uh, the gene that codes for phenols. So phenols are again, are the spicy, you know, they're the clove, the pepper, uh, they can be a little smoky, but you know, essentially they're the spicy things that you would get in a Belgian or a Hefeweizen. And that's what they did. They just snipped out with CRISPR-Cas9 that gene um, from a Hefeweizen strain. And then you have another one. So the Hefeweizen is called Bonanza like banana. Yes. yes. I actually, uh, I, 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 as a side note, that's, I did a beer heavy, heavy on the Michigan Chinook, uh, to get some of the pineapple. And then I used that bonanza yeast to try to get some of that banana flavor in there without the, uh, peppery clove taste. And, uh, and it was great. And, and, and I, th I thought it was pretty solid. Uh, good. I, we, I think our issue with it is I'm not sure we fermented it warm enough. I was so we do, again, we do this beer where it's like three or 4% half of Weizen yeast and we fermented in the sixties and it's pretty banana-y. And so I was nervous pushing bananas. I think they say to pitch it at, you know, 70 and let ramp up into, and I was just worried on a double IPA that it was just going to taste like banana juice. And instead it was just like relatively subdued. 
Yeah. Um, and so like it, it was a fine beer, but it, it, the banana aspect of it didn't sort of pop as much as we wanted it to. And was that uh, the beer? Macad- was that the was that the yeast that you guys used with the macadamia nut milk? Yeah. Yeah. So that was, uh, and we did, I think it was about 20 gallons of macadamia milk in the uh, Whirlpool. Um, I would say the flavor was uh, subtle. So I, I mean, that's almost not quite 10%, uh, maybe it was, you know, seven or 8% by volume uh, macadamia milk in the kettle. Um, yeah, I would say it was like a, a relatively subtle flavor. And honestly, what probably came through more was, I think it was a, a, a macadamia milk that had a little sort of vanilla flavor to it or something. I think that little vanilla thing came through a little more. We ended up sort of um, adding some vanilla beans and sort of playing that up okay. uh, a little bit more. Um, we've done, uh, we do a decent number of beer with uh, with nuts, but usually it is toasted nuts in like a stout or something like that. And we'll do that um, post-fermentation, you know, just the beer right on to uh, toasted walnuts or toasted almonds or something like that. And that I think that comes through really nicely, but uh, the the nut milk thing um, sort of didn't wow us. Uh, we'd, we'd tried it once or twice before, um, just mixing the uh, nut milk in post-fermentation. I think the lower pH of the beer causes the proteins in the nut milk to sort of, um, you're kind of making cheese or something like that. And so they kind of come out of suspension and settle and you end up with this sort of like crud, you know, protein gunk. Um, and so we were trying to add in the Whirlpool just to like, not have that happen and the beer was fine it was nice and hazy and all that but it just um i'm not sure it added that much to it got it do you guys ever uh use that other uh modified yeast that omega distributor sundew yeah the sundew yeast do you guys ever use that uh we i think we just did like uh, so we have this little 15 gallon fermenter Uh, we don't have a pilot system but we'll pull off some wort uh and we did a uh scott usually spearheads that stuff i think scott from ed something with sundew uh, and we liked it enough that we did a collab with uh, Bissell Brothers up in Maine yeah. called Book Learning. And they uh, they used Sundew for that. Um, I think the only major complaint about it that we had was that it was more attenuative than we expected it to be. So I think their their batch finished at 1012 or 1013 when they were hoping it would be a more 1016, 1017 kind of thing. So it came off um, a little bit drier than I would have liked. But I mean, that's sort of the the risk when you try something new that there's, there's always going to be a little bit of a learning curve. Um, we've also, we actually just did a collab with uh, other half. They have a new brewery in DC and we used uh, cosmic punch, which is another one from Omega labs, which is uh, they've taken a, a wine gene to express uh, the sort of fruity thiols from hops. And uh, we use that and that, and we'd actually use that in a, uh, another double IPA that we brewed with um phantasm powder which is dried powdered new zealand wine grapes so oh, sweet. that's we're doing a lot of the weird the weird yeast stuff <laughs> that's fun though that's that's fun stuff where do you guys see craft beer going in the next 10 years i mean what's what's the landscape looking like right now um i mean certainly at the moment it just sort of feels like it's it's everywhere um that i mean i think that's what you have to do to have i don't i don't know actually what the official count is if we're at six thousand or seven thousand breweries but um, I think we just need to keep pulling in more consumers who are not craft beer drinkers. And so I'm mean, obviously like hard seltzer has been a big part of that, that that is selling beer to people who would be drinking a cocktail or would be drinking a cider or would be drinking uh, a, a light wine or something like that. And obviously, you know, big stouts in a way appeal to, you know, and, and spirit barrel aging. Uh, we just had a couple of uh, uh, we're neighbors with uh, Sagamore Spirits uh, in Baltimore. It's a big rye distillery. And they had every once in a while, I think they said they have 20,000 barrels or something like that. But every once in a while, they'll say, oh, hey, we aged some uh, rye and some sherry barrels or some cognac barrels. If you guys want them, let us know. And so we just got a couple of sherry barrels that had Sagamore rye whiskey in them. And we swapped one of them. We had gotten a barrel, a cognac barrel from them that we had then put a sour beer in. And then we gave that barrel back to them. So now they're going, it was a cognac barrel. Then it was a rye whiskey barrel. Then it was a sour barrel. And now it's going to be a rye whiskey barrel again, because now they're going to make a rye whiskey barrel aged in a sour barrel or whatever. Um, But I think, you know, hey, hopefully we're pulling in some spirit drinkers, some people who are, you know, primarily bourbon or rye or whiskey drinkers. And now, hey, you know, come try this bourbon barrel stout. Come try this, you know, um, 
you know, beer with local rye or whatever it is. And so I, I think that's where beer is going. It's just sort of going to try to appeal to everybody. And, and even you see it with the, the non-alcoholic beer is, is going to be a bigger and bigger part in trying to sell beer to people who are not drinking alcohol, um, who, who for, uh, you know, religious or, or, you know, personal reasons or exercise reasons, you know, can't, can't knock back a 16 ounce can of double IPA on a Wednesday night, but still want to um, either hang out with people and, 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 you know, not be seen as lame or see some benefit in it or just like the flavor or, or whatever it is. Um, I, I'm not sure. So like, obviously the like, um, and we haven't gotten into it much, the, the uh, smoogy, like thick puree sort of things. We haven't done much of it. Um, our, our friends in the industry who I think do it right are sterile filtering to make sure they're not re-fermenting. It just, it sounds like a whole uh, hassle. Uh, we'll do so, we'll do kegs of that kind of stuff. But I also, I don't know if something like that is going to be, you know, huge in 10 years or totally forgotten, or if it's just going to be another little niche of the industry, just like, you know, Pilsner and, and whatever else that there's just, Hey, there's, you know, Hey, and, and puree beers or Hey, and, you know, uh, milkshake beers with real milk or I, as there's so many um, weird and wonderful things happening. And, and I hope most of them are for something other than sort of, you know, shock value or, um, you know, that kind of thing that it's, it's really a well thought out thing and not just let's make the, the craziest thing we can think of. Yeah. Which sometimes, sometimes happens. <laughs> what do you think is the biggest lie told in craft beer? You know, something that's kind of widely accepted, but you just don't agree with that at all. Well, I'm, I'm not sure it's a lie as much as it is like, um, like beer, beer is a relatively inexpensive thing to make. Our, our accountant is always surprised by where our margins are, but so much of that is uh, direct sales. And I would say that as, as a craft beer consumer, the best thing you can do to support your local brewery is to go to the brewery to buy your beer. Uh, whether that's, you know, rather than going to a bar, you know, going to a local brewery and getting a, getting a sample paddle and going home with a couple of four packs. Um, that's the sort of thing that really allows us to do really fantastic beer. Um, I, at some point I sort of did the math out, you know, one of our double IPAs and um, we're not very efficient. You know, we don't repitch yeast for 50 generations. We don't have great hop contracts. And still our double IPA costs us about a dollar to brew, you know, a 14 or a 16 ounce pour of it. Um, where that's, that really breaks down is that when you start distributing it and you are paying for packaging, you're paying 30% to your distributor, you're paying for, you know, the label for the, all that stuff. Um, and the more we can sell in house, spending an extra 20 cents on hops for that glass really doesn't matter if we're, you know, if you're paying seven bucks for it, it matters a whole lot. Uh, and we've, we've talked to some, uh, some guys from bigger breweries who, you know, breweries that started in the nineties who have literally tanks that are bigger than our entire annual production. And we'll say, Oh, you know, this hop oil, it's, it's, it's pretty, it's pretty inexpensive, you know, something like, you know, $10 per a barrel. So, you know, the equivalent of, uh, 30 cents a gallon for the hop extract. And we think that that's just this, like, it's free. It's like, who, you know, it's for a five gallon keg as a homebrew, it's a dollar 50. And it's like, it's like we've accused him of, you know, it's just like, what, $10? Like that would double, you know, double our cost or, you know. Yeah. Um, and so, but that's a totally different business model, but that's why there's such a difference between the beers that you get at your local supermarket and the beers being produced at your local brewery is at those big breweries, they have to be very cost conscious um, because so many other people have their hand in, in the cookie jar. But also honestly, because you know, if, if you're buying a six pack for $12, that's two bucks a, a bottle and I'm pouring you a draft and, and my 12 ounce pour of the draft is gonna be a lot more than $2. And I'm getting all that $2. Um, and so that's, I, I'd say that like, beer ingredients and brewing is not that expensive. It's not, and it's one of the great things about being a home brewer is that you, you know, can just sort of, you know, pay ingredient costs for the stuff. Um, but that as a, a commercial brewery, like the weird things that we're able to do only work because people 
go out of their way and come to us and stock up and bring you know cans home for their friends and trade the beers and and all those sorts of things are really what keeps us um, able to uh, do weird experiments and keep learning. And um, you know, every once in a while, a batch doesn't work out, or we really have to pivot on something. And and we can do that because of the support of uh, you and drinkers like you. Awesome. Yeah, that's that's good. It's good to know. Um, PSA, everybody out there, <laughs> go support to your, your local brewery, brewery. Support the heck out of them. It it, it matters. Um, well, and, and and I'll say too that and that and that sort of plays into the like everyone's all sounds like oh you guys should do a West Coast IPA you why why does anyone brew brown ales anymore because people don't buy them uh, if you if there's a style you like the best thing you can get to you know make that style more available is to buy the heck out of that beer when it's available yeah. you know go go buy a case of it and and enjoy that brown ale for the next couple of months that really sends the biggest message to a brewery of we'll keep most breweries if, if something sells they'll keep making it and they're not going to intentionally not make a beer that people want because they're jerks it's they know at their, their scale they can't move through that much beer or it won't sell in distribution or or whatever it is yeah no doubt it makes makes perfect sense all right michael i got one final question it's uh it's the end of times it's your last night on this earth you got one beer with you it, it could be as many of that one beer as you want but w what are you drinking on that final night yeah for, for me honestly it, it doesn't matter the exact configuration of that question the desert island the it, it's always uh like tree fontaine and goose uh you know just something that is those belgian lambics to me are just um they hit that right note of like you can think about them and you can care about them and you can analyze them or you can just have three of them and they're tart and refreshing and easy to drink. Um, and I think that that is, there, there's few beers that are both as nuanced and as complex and as, as deep as a great goose and at the same time that you could, you know, be sitting watching sports on TV and have a nice cold mug of it and, not think about it at all if you didn't want to that they're you know they're not obnoxious they're not sweet they're not um uh, you know overly bitter they're not overly um you know uh i mean hop, hops can be hit or miss but something like that just for me is always fantastic yeah it's, that's a great beer and it's funny it's funny you uh mentioned that one in particular too i have one in my cellar right now i think it's been in there probably close to like six years and nice. I should probably should probably crack that one and see if it's uh still has some life left in it but um yeah that's the great thing about those beers too is that you know there's they're, they're going to be good even if it's a little old or a little mistreated um whereas you know an ipa if it's we'll, we get people oh, oh this you sure this double ipa is okay it says it was canned three weeks ago like <laughs> come on <laughs> yeah geez yeah it's like it's probably just about to enter its prime well, it, it, yeah, and, then, and that is always, I mean, there's always, you know, packaging differences and where, but I, I, uh, I, I really enjoy beers that you don't have to be too precious with, that you don't have to go, oh, you know, I better make sure I get that in the fridge right after I get home, or I better not forget that, you know, in the car for the weekend or whatever. Yes, yes. Something about, something about simplicity sometimes strikes a chord for sure. Um, yeah. Well, I appreciate you uh, taking time and coming on today. Uh, it was great chatting about sapwood, about, you know, your techniques, some of your favorite hops. Uh, you know, any home brewers out there, especially who are interested in, in making better hoppy beers, check out what these guys are doing. Um, and I hope one day soon I can uh, get over to your guy's place to to spend a uh, man i'm gonna have to spend at least a couple days there i can't do it all in, in a night uh <laughs> too much too much to savor and take in but uh I'd, I'd love to to meet you guys face to face out there and uh and get to try some of your beer yeah that would be awesome please just let us know if you're uh if you're coming down between baltimore and dc and uh we'll give you the tour and uh, pull you some samples awesome all right thanks michael yeah cheers